I'm Jeff Bezos. Jeff who? The world's first ever person to amass a $200 billion fortune. You can choose a life of ease and comfort, or you can choose a life of service and adventure. Which one of those, when you're 90 years old, are you going to be more proud of? It's easy to have ideas. It's very hard to turn an idea into a successful product. There are a lot of steps in between, and it takes persistence, relentlessness. So I always tell people who are, you know, who think they want to be entrepreneurs, it's you need a combination of stubborn relentlessness and flexibility. And you have to know when to be which. And basically you need to be stubborn on your vision because otherwise it'll be too easy to give up. But you need to be very flexible on the details because as you go along pursuing your vision, you'll find that some of your preconceptions were wrong and you're gonna need to be able to change those things. So I think uh, taking an idea successfully all the way to the market and turning it into a real product that people care about and that really improves people's lives is a lot of hard work. If I were a young college student today, um, I would be very interested in biotechnology. I think biotechnology is a, just a fascinating arena that probably in the near, in the next 10 or 20 years, is going to be a golden age of biotech. One of the golden ages that's happening right now before our eyes is also artificial intelligence and machine learning. So that's another arena that I would, I would be very interested in. It's very important for entrepreneurs to be realistic. And so if you believe on that first day while you're writing the business plan that there's a 70% chance that the whole thing will fail, and, you know, uh, then that kind of relieves the pressure of, of self-doubt. I mean, it's sort of like, I don't have any doubt about whether we're going to fail. That's the likely outcome. Um, and, and it just is. And to pretend that it's not will lead you to do strange and you know, uh, uh, unnatural things. So we, uh, uh, you know, in what you do with those early investment dollars, you know, so if you have three hundred thousand dollars and then you have a million dollars, what you do with those early precious capital resources is you go about systematically trying to eliminate risk. So you pick whatever the, you know, you think the biggest problems are and you try to eliminate them one at a time. And that's, uh, that's how small companies get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger until finally, at a certain stage, you reach a transition where you have, where the company has more control over its future destiny. This is very important for anybody who's going to start a company or, or, or market an invention to understand is that brands for companies are like reputations for people. And reputations are hard earned and easily lost. So the most important intellectual property that a company can have is, for us, it's that, it's, it's, it's Amazon. It's the, that name, but what it stands for. We've worked very hard to earn trust. You can't ask for trust. You just have to do it the hard way, one step at a time. You, you make a promise and then fulfill the promise. You say, we'll deliver this to you uh, you know, tomorrow, and you actually deliver it tomorrow. <laughs> and if you do that over and over again, then it ultimately you can instill your company's name with a reputation. And that's, I think, you know, sometimes people talk about brands in this very amorphous way, but for me, I, I like to think of it as a person. And what is the reputation of that person have, and how have they earned that reputation? Everything I have ever done has started small. Um, Amazon started with a couple of people, and um, uh, Blue Origin started with five people, and uh, the budget of Blue Origin was very, very small. Now the budget of Blue Origin is, approaches a billion dollars a year, and next year it'll be more than a billion dollars. And Amazon, who literally was 10 people, today it's half a million people, but you, you, it's hard to remember for you guys, but for me it's like yesterday, I was driving the packages to the post office myself and um, hoping one day we could afford a forklift. And so, but so for me, I've seen small things get big and it's part of this day one mentality. I like treating things as if, if they're small. You know, Amazon, even though it is a large company, I wanted to have the heart and spirit of a small one. I often tell people um, that I work with, if you can get, because people, 
people have very high standards for how they want their work life to be. And, uh, and I said, look, if you can get your work life to be where you enjoy half of it, that is a home, that is amazing. Because very few people ever achieve that. Because the truth is, everything comes with overhead. That's reality. Everything comes with pieces that you don't like. You can be a Supreme Court justice and there's still gonna be pieces of your job you don't like. You can be a university professor and it's still gonna be, you have to go to committee meetings and you have to do things. You know, there, every job comes with pieces you don't like. And we need to say, that's just how, that's part of it. Uh, and, and, and not resent those pieces, or try not to, uh, but also try to minimize them. The stress primarily comes from not taking action over something that you can have some control over. So if I find that some particular thing is causing me to have stress, that's a, uh, a, a, a warning flag for me. What it means is there's something that I haven't completely identified perhaps in my conscious mind that is bothering me and I haven't yet taken any action on it. I find as soon as I identify it and make the first phone call or send off the first email message or whatever it is that we're gonna do to start to address that situation, even if it's not solved, the mere fact that we're addressing it dramatically reduces any stress that might come from it. So stress comes from ignoring things that you shouldn't be ignoring. Um, I think in large part. So uh, stress doesn't come, people get stress uh, uh, wrong all the time in my opinion. Stress doesn't come from hard work, for example. You know, you can be working incredibly hard and loving it. And likewise, you can be out of work and incredibly stressed over that. So, and likewise, if you kind of use the, you know, use that as an analogy for what I was just talking about, if you're out of work, but you're going through, you know, a disciplined uh, approach of, you know, a series of job interviews and so on and working to remedy that situation, you're going to be a lot less stressed than if you're just worrying about it and doing nothing. A young person should find something that they're passionate about to do. And um, that's not going to surprise anyone. It's, it's a clear thing to do. It's very hard. If you don't love your work, you're never going to be great at it. And I think people don't dislike hard work. What people dislike is being um, out of control. Like, they can't control their life. They can't control their environment. This happens to me when I get overscheduled. I hate being overscheduled. I want some time be able to think and free myself. We all have the same amount of time. Nobody has more time than anybody else. And when you become a very successful person, one of the things you start to do is get over schedule. And so you have to guard your time and, uh, and try to say a little bit flexible. So that's, to me, it's not a waste of time, but I like to have some freedom of movement. Uh, rather than having every minute of every day scheduled. I actually don't like plan Bs. I, I find plan Bs are, they defocus you from plan A. Plan B should always be make plan A work.